Most of us think of surgery taking off in the mid-19th century when anesthetic, then antiseptic, then aseptic techniques transformed the field. Human beings, however, have practiced surgery since cutting implements were invented. So what did surgical practice look like in the pre-modern world? For much of that time, surgeons could be the healthcare provider of last resort, when untreatable pain was unbearable, when death was a foregone conclusion, or when prayer was ineffective. Surgeons could be quite successful, as those who treated cataracts, those who set bones, or those who removed urinary stones. Surgical practitioners were, however, most often illiterate, apprenticed or self-trained, itinerant, and largely invisible to historians looking today. Now, the Middle Ages ran from roughly 500 to 1500 AD, that period of Western history after the fall of the Roman Empire and before the rebirth of classical culture, the so-called Renaissance. Several things happened to surgery in the Middle Ages. First, Western Europe invented universities. Up until that time, most healers were also illiterate and trained by doing. But sometime around the middle of the 12th century, surgery and medicine proper separated as disciplines. And around 1150 to 1200, medicine itself, what we might consider internal medicine today, began to affiliate with universities. With that affiliation, academic medicine became highly literate, focused on teaching and investigation, and accrued great social cachet to itself. Thus, medicine sat atop a pyramid of professional authority, lording it over more manual practitioners like surgeons. We still see echoes of the separation of physicians and surgeons in the names of medical schools, such as Columbia University's Physicians and Surgeons, or the Royal Colleges of Physicians and Surgeons in Canada or Scotland. But with the rise of the universities, prestige in research, teaching, and to some degree practice linked with those who were university professors. As non-surgical physicians attracted that prestige, so too did surgeons wish to do. A few learned literate surgeons acquired university degrees and positions, along with appointments at the courts of kings and popes. From early groups of such scholar practitioners came the powerful guilds or unions of surgeons and the surgical faculties that would help found modern academic surgery in Europe and North America. Now, a second dramatic change that came with the first literary research works of high-level surgeons was the acceleration of so-called schools of thought. Increasingly, surgeons decided that there were right and wrong ways to practice for certain conditions or certain procedures. Cardinal amongst these was the therapeutic value of pus, the often discussed laudable pus. The crux of the argument, as related by royal surgeon Henry of Montville in the early 14th century, stemmed from the impression that a strict diet and extensive wound manipulation would in turn create an abscess that would draw out the humorous poisons within the body. This position would be staked out by the papal surgeon and most influential of medieval surgical authors, Guy of Choliac, some 50 years later. But two other schools of thought existed. Montville himself favored a less strict diet and cleansing of the wound with wine and other agents. The third school of thought for, sought a halfway point between the other two. Echoes of this debate would continue well into the American Civil War, suggesting just how long-lasting some medieval influences have been. A third change arose with regulations for practice. Regulations came from the Catholic Church, from municipalities, from royal courts, and from guilds of practitioners themselves. The earliest injunctions were against improper practice or malpractice, being at once attempts to safeguard consumers, but also to limit external competition. Increasingly, from the 12th into the 14th centuries and beyond, kings as well as groups of surgical practitioners determined that certain people were appropriate to practice surgery and others were not. The deciding line could be based on citizenship, examination, training, or group membership. These boundaries more and more often included rules about what could and could not be performed by a registered practitioner. Linked to these boundaries was a growing literature about what made a good surgeon. Choliac, for example, stressed that a surgeon should be a learned expert 
ingenious and adaptable. Now, a fourth change involved translated documents and instruments. Intellectually, for the West, the most innovative event for the development of surgical instruments was the translation from Arabic into Latin of al bukhasis's Kitab al-Tazrif by Gerard of Cremona in the 12th century. The larger text, written around 1000 AD, included much more on medical ideas, but the section on surgery became wildly popular in medieval Europe. Subsequently, it was important to the work of surgical authors such as Choliac in his magisterial Great Surgery and went through a number of vernacular translations throughout Europe. Abukas's work was very influential in conveying textual imagery of surgical instruments. Not surprisingly, the less practically oriented copyists of his Latin translations often misunderstood the images and diagrams of instruments as decorative surgery. Their own illuminations left out the intended meanings. Practical surgical authors such as Monville and Choliac innovated instrument design by necessity, and by the early modern period, inventive German instrument makers coincided with a renewed interest in older and contemporary surgical texts, provoking new illustrations in early printed books of instruments, since, uh, such as Hieronymus Brunschwig's Book of Surgery in 1497 and Ambroise Paré's texts in 1545 and 1564. Recent research has described a, a kind of medical instrumentalism that was progressively espoused in the 13th and 14th centuries. This intellectual approach allowed empiricism to define justifiable knowledge in the face of traditional elite thought. Practical experience interpreted within the framework of the new medical universities gave primacy to medical explanations over philosophical ones, thus further opening the door for surgery's rise as a profession in the early modern and modern periods.